All right, I think we're good. What's up, John? How you been? Good, man. How are you? I'm well. I'm well, you guys are true heroes right there. You know, fighting with the store. Hold on, let me turn to Echo. Sorry about that with the echo, but no, we're good to go. Yeah, but glad to have you on, John. Why don't you give yeah, me a quick glad, intro glad for the folks who are watching? Just a quick intro about your background. And then I want to hear about what drink you got in your hand, too. <laughs> so I, I'm John McFarland. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Moffitt Cancer Center. We're a uh, NCI designated comprehensive cancer center based in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we're about 7,000 employees, and we see uh, almost 70,000 distinct patients every year. Um, you know, before we get started too, too far, I want to thank, uh, you know, my teams and, and all the healthcare workers across the, the globe right now for what they're doing being at the front lines of, of COVID-19. Uh, you know, we're here to support them, uh, but, but they're really the, the champions and the heroes of what's going on in the world right now. Definitely. No, I definitely <clears throat> agree with that. I mean, the frontline staff, are you guys short of PPEs? Are you guys good? I hope you guys have enough in stock. Yeah, we're we're in pretty good shape. We haven't seen a, a huge influx of of COVID patients by by any means. You know, our, our care is a little different, um, so we, we haven't seen a, a drought on that quite yet. Um, but of course, we're c competing with with every other healthcare organization and everyone else for it right now as well. Yeah, no, definitely. All right, what's in your hand? What's in your hand <laughs> on that for the drinks? Sure. So uh, one of my favorite go-to bourbons, little Buffalo Trace on on nice. a big cube. Most important part, it's in uh, my Pebble Beach rocks glass. Nice. The Pebble Beach coming out. We had Will Walters last time. He's a big whiskey bourbon guy, too. So he made his uh, Sazerac. So. Uh, yeah, I kept it simple tonight. Just just straight up on, on a big rock. Yeah, I'm sticking to some wine, some 2016 Black Stallion. Nothing crazy, just easy to drink. But I got to go back and forth between. I'm sure I have a few um, bourbons after. I, I, we get later towards the night. Actually, <laughs> that's, I have a, that's a whole call. different different time with David, right? <laughs> <laughs> have you right. Uh, have you tried the the new David Finney stuff? The locations it's pretty pretty decent, uh, about twenty dollar bottle. If you want to try it. Oh yeah, no, I've never heard of it. I'm gonna go check. Yeah, it out. no, he was the one behind the Prisoner back in the day, and uh, he's come back into the wine scene, and he's uh, he's used in California to uh, create wines with flavors of, of different areas uh, throughout the world. So good good. Um, yeah. What is it called? Davis, Davis. David Finney, and the location is called uh, Locations. So I was just speaking about something about that, where they had a bottle of wine and they said it's bourbon infused. I wonder if it's the same thing. I wonder if it's that same, because it, the, the, obviously the taste is a little bit different than traditional wine, but it was good. Yeah, I, I like the bourbon infused uh, reds. The, the bourbon infused whites are uh, mm, not a fan. All right, it's good to know. So next time when we're, we're catching up live, we got to find those bourbon infused reds. All right, we'll do it. All right. So what's going on in your world? You, you, you were telling me before we got on some great integration with your uh, virtual care. T tell us more about it. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like everyone else, right, we've, we've been reacting to, to the reality of the world over the last five weeks. Um, we were pretty lucky, you know, I, when I stepped into this role a couple of years ago, we really focused on technical debt payoff and, and scalability. And that was really due to our growth as an organization. And I never wanted to um, be the boat anchor to what the organization wanted to do. Um, and as such, we, we were able to scale pretty effectively. Uh, we went from about 350 remote workers on a daily basis to um, uh, we average about 2,800 right now um, and, and about 4,000 distinct people working from home represent about 52% of our workforce. So pretty crazy scale there. Um, on the virtual visit side, we were seeing you know a couple a day. Um, and, and just yesterday, I think we had 408 scheduled. Um, so just the, the, the multipliers in, in the technology utilization is just absolutely crazy. Um, and I'd say the, the really interesting part for me is to watch the, the culture change across an organization. You know, I think most healthcare organizations are, are pretty conservative, right? Um, you know, video conferencing is, is something that's sparingly used and, and frowned upon when, right? In person is the way to, way to go. Um, and to watch my organization anyway adapt video chat. Um, and, and video conferencing has, has been really interesting as the CTO, um, especially as you look at people, you know, we use we use Zoom um, and, and people competing with virtual backgrounds, like who's got the funniest or coolest one in the meeting. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to watch that that transformation of, of the organization into using digital capabilities in order to do business. 
that's a great icebreaker during your team meeting is just be able to break the ice, have some cool background, talk about something else besides work, keep it a little bit more informal. Otherwise, this is a new environment and folks are still adjusting, but I always say most have adjusted pretty well. No, absolutely. And actually, the, the senior IT leadership team, we, we have a daily theme now. Um, so I, I think tomorrow is your favorite 80s television show. Um, so we've all got to procure a background around around that theme. So it, it, it's fun. You learn a little bit about other people. Uh, one individual, I won't uh, won't name them, but they sh- today was your favorite band. Um, they showed up with, with Toots and the Maytals. So uh, I d- didn't realize they were a reggae fan. So it's interesting what you learn about people. Yeah, no, definitely. That's pretty awesome. So someone asked a question, you know, I mean, right now everyone's focusing on scaling out virtual environments for telehealth, remote workforce. Do you see that tapering off post COVID or do you see this as the norm? I think, um, I think we'll see. Um, my personal you know, opinion is I, I think it's going to become the norm. Um, I don't think we're going to see it at the scale that we do today. Right. I, I don't think, you know, after this, we're going to see 52% of our workforce working from home. Um, but I think we're going to see a sizable increase. You know, I think the number is 20 to 25%. Uh, when you think about call center folks, IT folks, people that, that really they could do their job anywhere, um, I, I think that that will be a big push. You know, most healthcare organizations are space strapped, right? Um, whether you're in a big city or, or even us, right? Space is, is a premium. Um, and so if you can use, you know, remote workforce to alleviate, you know, a, a, highly expensive um, real estate play. It's, it's, it's attractive to any organization. So I, I do think it'll hold on. Um, you know, again, on the virtual visit side, I, I think same thing. I think it'll it'll still be heavy utilization um, to the degree it is today. Maybe not. Uh, but I think it'll be much more commonplace on the other side than it was before, for sure. Yeah, I hope it kind of sticks. I mean, luckily, I would say the last year of my life, I work virtually, remotely. So It'll be very hard to adapt all of a sudden. Let's say we're doing this for another month, hopefully with another month, but let's say another month or two months. It's a big adjustment for the staff to go back because now they're so used to being at home. They could do their daily stuff that needs to be done in addition to work. So there's that that work-life balance that they never had before versus being inside a hospital. So only time will tell, but we'll see. It's interesting too. I, I think we, we all need to realize that the work from home that we're doing today is, isn't the work from home that we might be doing tomorrow. So my wife actually works from home a couple of days a week. Um, and, and she said, even the environment that we're working in today is completely different, right? Because I, I'm here, our, our daughter's here. Um, you know, the, the, we've got two docs and puppies and, and they're so excited to have all of us home all the time. And, and that's different than when you're working from home by yourself, right? Um, so I think we all, the folks that this is new for them, that this, the reality of today isn't necessarily what work from home looks like tomorrow. The technology is the same, but the environment's different. Yeah, that's a good point. Having the kids at home, all of a sudden we're like PE teachers, cafeteria ladies. I mean, all this uh-huh. stuff just to, <laughs> it's painful. Yeah. I'm about to go back to work. <laughs> well, and and you know, just the reality of of social distancing and trying to stay out of the public, right? It's it's you you're you're feeling cooped up much more than you would in, in just hey, I work from home but I can still go out to dinner, right? That that doesn't happen today. All right. So post COVID, you know, let's say two months from now, what what are your plans? What are you guys going to focus on? So I think, you know, it, we're going to continue our modernization and, and scalability journey. Um, I don't think that changes post COVID. I do think some things accelerate. Um, you know, my, my unified communications roadmap has, has the, the rails have gotten greased on that for sure. Um, we, we've dropped product in that we were planning on doing, you know, six, eight months from now. We've done it in two, three days. Um, and so accelerating a lot of that. I, I think the one thing that we got caught with somewhat unexpectedly was was the the need for phone connectivity right and and being able to show the patient that they're calling from a Moffitt phone line um, to get them to answer the phone right um, and so that that was probably the biggest struggle we've had is how do we enable that um, and so I think really pushing soft phones is, is going to be a big piece of, of you know strategy in, in the near term um, it was something we were looking at a, a little further out but um, because, you know, it, it's used by executives and, and highly mobile people. And that's probably where the play was historically. Um, but tomorrow, I think it's, it's you know, the, the remote workforce and how do they have a phone line that is a, a Moffer Cancer Center number um, and be able to utilize that to call patients and, and other folks. So I think that's a big piece that, that will accelerate. 
Um, and then just continuing our digital workplace strategy, right? Um, getting to, you know, any app, anywhere, anytime. Um, and, and that's been a big focus as, as we've tried to, to virtualize our application strategy more and more. Um, so I think that just become gets in the forefront. Um, and then BYOD, right? Um, that was the other big thing. I know a lot of healthcare organizations struggled with it, just didn't have the, the laptop quantities to be able to send people home with, with corporately issued devices. So I think that ability for someone to be able to use their personal device to access corporate um, information is going to be vitally important too in, in the new world. Yeah, definitely. You brought up a very interesting comment about having Moffitt's phone number display on caller ID, because when you think about a lot of us right now, we get all these um, spam calls, right? So, mm -hmm. so we don't pick any phone call that we do not recognize. So if they do not recognize the number from Moffitt, very good chance they're not going to pick that number up, even yep. though it is coming from someone within the healthcare Moffitt world. <clears throat> so that's a very interesting uh, sort of proposition that we have to solve. Uh, from a health IT perspective. It's one of these little nuances that people don't think about, but it's pretty crucial. Well, it, what's going to be interesting is I think, um, you know, as, as you look at the telephony world, um, the idea of cloud PBX is is being introduced by a lot of the big vendors. And, and I think a lot of folks are, are hesitant to go down that path just because of how new it is and how critical the telephony environment is to any organization. Uh, but I think we're going to start really thinking about a hybrid telephony world, right? Can I leverage a cloud PBX and the on-prem in order to deliver the, the services we need? Um, you know, if you had asked me two, three months ago, um, I, I was, yeah, you know, cloud PBX, let's, let's talk about it, you know, 24 months from now, maybe. Um, uh, but I, I had a very real conversation the other day ab about going down that path, right? How do I get someone a handset at home, um, and be able to access, you know, have a Moffitt number ring there. Um, and, and that's just stuff that was, I think, somewhat a pipe dream for technology professionals, you know, three months ago. Uh, but this is stuff that, that we've wanted to do. We, we know is good for our organizations and now it's just, it, the organizations are asking for it. So it's an interesting, you know, other side of the coin now. Yeah, even I personally struggle with, you know, that having that deployed just because of the engineers were not as familiar, <clears throat> there was not a big push. So, I mean, even my last one edition, we still had truck lines, SIP trunks. Like, God, I haven't seen this for years. Why are we still doing this? Um, but no, I think Cloud PBX is definitely the, the right way to go. You still need the you know, the red lines, you still got to have the traditional lines for, for those, from my understanding, for the patient rooms. But I would say for the majority of your organization, you know, you're, you're on the right path moving towards a cloud PBX. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't think going fully in that direction is, is the answer for tomorrow. But, you know, I think a hybrid world, absolutely. Um, you know, again, how do I set up an employee to work from home and, and it'd be just like they're sitting in the office. And so, you know, SD-WAN and cloud PBX and all of these things that, that, you know, from a technologist theorist perspective is, is great to look at. Um, and, and we want to plan, but it, it's the reality is we need it today. Um, and, and we're going to need it tomorrow with these large workforces, you know, not necessarily being in our brick and mortar. Yes. Yeah, so, so you just mentioned something SD-WAN. I'm always <laughs> curious how to, why, Healthcare providers really have not utilized that as much. It's not. It's proven. It's been there for a long time. I just. I just have not seen that deploy. I mean, I talked to all these uh, great SD WAN vendors who are are trying to crack into the healthcare provider space, and I almost feel like a lot of the technologists they just either don't understand it or they're not interested. And it's very odd to me. I think, you know, it, when I think about my, put my operational hat on and, and my architect hat off, right? Um, I, I want something that's tried and true, right? I, I'm, I know it's going to work. So, you know, if I'm putting up a new facility somewhere, I'd, I'd rather just drop two circuits and run it to it because I know it's going to function, right? Um, and, and SDN, to your point, it is, it's proven. Uh, but when the last thing I want to do is make a, a decision like that and then get blamed for, the building being offline because of the, the technical decision you made, right? So I think it's the old the old saying, uh, you don't get fired for buying IBM. And I think, you know, the circuits are IBM, right? And, and you know, SD-WAN is, is kind of the, the up and comer. Uh, but I do think there's a play for it and, and a legitimate reason to go it down that path as we look at a more distributed workforce in healthcare. Sweet. Well, last question. What do you recommend for the folks to be thinking about post-COVID in addition to what you talked about? <laughs> um, 
you know, I think, think about all those things that, um, that have been on your short list, kind of on the sticky in your drawer, right? If, if the world could change, I would go do this thing, um, to enable my organization, but the, you know, for whatever reason, there's been barriers around it. Um, you know, dig that out. I, I think I read something the other day that COVID-19 has made organizations realize how important IT really is to the operations. Um, and so I think it, it gives us a new seat at the table um, to help enable um, the, the digital path forward for, you know, the new world. So, uh, you know, th those crazy ideas, get them out of the drawer and let's talk about them uh, because it, it might very well be able to, to propel our organizations forward in healthcare in general. No, definitely. COVID-19 is what transformed us digitally, so <laughs> partially true if you think about it. it. I think it certainly forces it, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's it's an uncomfortable transformation for a lot of people, right? Um, again, I, I circle back to the video conferencing thing. Um, people were, were afraid of it, you know, and, and people would be so stoic when they were on it. They wouldn't relax and, and behave like they would in a normal meeting. But, you know, I think you're seeing them get comfortable with that technology. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's the play forward for sure. All right, there you have it, John McFarner, CTO at Moffitt. Thanks for joining, John. Thanks, David, for having me. Good seeing you.